Thank, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, you really, you really said two good words for me. I feel very nervous now. Um, I was explaining to Jonathan all the way here how coming from architecture is a bit awkward being among other disciplines because we we have a more hands-on and practical approach, and then I know other disciplines have much more strict methodological approaches. So we'll see. Things will come up, and feel free to challenge me as much as uh, you like. That will be very useful to me. So I'll, I'll uh, start straight away. Um, effectively, what I'm going to talk about is how this research is developing. It's not completed. Um, it's been a lot of detective work and archival research trying to actually find out what happened at the time because it's very, very fragmentary. So um, as I mentioned in the abstract, um, there's a lot of work still ongoing from the history of psychiatry side on 20th century, there's a lot that hasn't been covered, a lot that hasn't been fully um, investigated in terms of the complexity and a lot of major changes. And in terms of spaces and places, it's even less developed. Um, there's this huge assumption, uh, which I faced the moment I was trying to start that, that the main development in terms of architecture and space and mental health was what the big asylums. Um, that has a lot to do with bias within architecture and architectural history. Uh, because we, um, there used to be this trend where we look, you know, at larger structures, newly designed buildings, purpose designed buildings. There was a, an art historical approach in the past. So a lot to do with style, with beauty, with aesthetics, all these kind of things. A lot of change for sure. But um, in terms of mental health, in particularly other other policies, which will I will try and touch upon. Uh, also impacted on the fact that there wasn't really much research on what's happening on, on the 20th uh, century. Um, so the first thing when I, I wanted to start with post-war because I've worked in conservation on 20th century and the post-war period was a key thing because that's where the big challenge was. It was a new thing in the 90s, but it's still ongoing. There are a lot of challenges. So that was the big question. Having worked in that sector, I never came across something that had to do with psychiatry and mental health. And I was like, why is that the case? I was completely ignorant, to be, to be frank. Um, but I only found these three units um, in an architectural history book about post-war architecture in, in England. And these are three admission uh, units. The titles vary slightly, but they're effectively the same thing. Um, two of them were for um, institutions for mentally for mental illness, and the third one is for what we nowadays call learning disabilities. Uh, so that was the only three buildings I could find in that whole volume about uh, post-war architecture in England. Um, that's when I started looking into it. I was like, oh, I want to find out more. Uh, and that's when I, I was given the answer. There's nothing because uh, we had deinstitutionalization, so therefore there's nothing. I'm a little bit more stubborn, <laughs> so I wanted to, I wanted to, um, I dig a little bit deeper and I started um, doing a lot of searches online in different, um, you know, depositories or, or um, libraries. And I did start to find a few more things, which was fuel for me to, to carry on. Um, so as, as you all know, um, this is more or less the type of buildings we are more familiar with, um, quite notorious. Uh, I mean, we have early buildings that were not even a specific typology, um, but the ones at the top, they were not really specialist hospitals or um, mental hospitals or asylums. They were very ordinary buildings uh, that were used for what we nowadays call mental health care. Um, and then we started with a lot of policy introduced, especially during the 19th century, where there was a lot of responsibility passed on gradually to local authorities, uh, that um, new typologies started developing, uh, and they became really large and really complex buildings. And these are at the bottom, these are just two uh, examples. Um, carrying on to the 20th century, um, these some of these asylum typologies continued developing a little bit. For example, this uh, the one in the middle. Um, it shows that um, the gradual evolution of the what's called the echelon plan type, which was the last um, uh, type that we can sort of associate with these kind of asylums. And you can see already the complexity there. there uh, and and a, an example of a built uh, a, a built example. Uh, in the right uh, photograph. In terms of 20th century, apart from this uh, continu 
continuation of um, the asylums we had in the 19th century. The one thing that's been recognized in architectural historiography uh, is the colonies. Um, in, in other parts of the world, that was a little bit earlier, so in continental Europe, that, all, that already developed in the late 19th century. Um, it arrived in the UK side later, mainly 20th century, and that's the one recognized evolution and contribution in terms of architecture. Um, so they were mainly associated with, again, what we nowadays call learning difficulties, but we do have two known uh, very late, uh, sort of in the 1930s, two large asylums still, mental hospitals as they were called at the time, built in the 1930s. One of them is the Runwell, which I'm showing here, and there too the colony uh, approach is being uh, adapted. Um, it, it looks very much like an echelon um, asylum, except you don't have the connections with the, the long, very notorious, again, corridors between the buildings, uh, but they're rather uh, individual structures. So they start resembling, the whole thing with these colonies is that they start resembling villages rather than large institutions, um, attempts about, you know, the institutionalization in terms of um, the, the symbolism of, of the building rather than the actual uh, administrative side, side of, of uh, how this um, healthcare, if you, if you call it. Again, the terms change so quickly, it's very difficult to be very precise when you refer to different time periods. So most of the terms I'm using are sort of contemporary rather than of the time. So um, there is this early approach to the institutionalization, not what, what we associate nowadays, but the fact that we just try to change the image and the impression on people by breaking down uh, buildings. So um, carrying on, what I decided was that I'm going to narrow down the topic I was starting with, because mental illness and mental and learning difficulties were becoming two distinct areas and they were being approached uh, separately. So I started effectively from the three buildings I had that I identified uh, initially. I, I was focusing on what the first two um, were uh, reflecting. Um, and that's also what I, I mentioned in the, in the abstract that I'm focusing on one particular building type. Uh, they carry a number of different names. They're, they're, they're either called units or hospitals. Um, and the three different more common names are uh, admission or reception, which means more or less the same thing. And early treatment is the other, the other title. And they're all linked to policies, gradual policies. Um, the reason I focus on them is, is primarily because um, of the, these three examples that I could find initially, uh, but also it became evident that they were funded especially. So there were a lot of additions in existing mental hospitals, a lot of um, very ordinary buildings added all the time, a lot of conversions, a lot of interior uh, reconfigurations, but this for some reason had um, received uh, additional funding at different parts of the uh, of the 20th century, uh, and also because they were published in the architectural press, they were receiving more investment in terms of the architectural design and who would be commissioned to design them. So that's why I thought uh, I am guilty as such because I'm doing what I said. <laughs> There's a bias in architectural history, so I'm still focusing on purpose-built um, buildings. Uh, but it's interesting because you can follow certain threads with these buildings. I know of other research in the field that is developing as we speak that they do look at interiors. There are a lot of other approaches, but I, I am guilty as charged. I'm focusing the more old fashioned approach in this sense. Um, I will not speak, just to clarify, I mentioned the um, psychiatric wings in district general hospital. I will not speak about them because I can't find, I found a lot of information, admin um, files, records, uh, written material, but I can't find any visual material, which for architects is quite uh, important. It's not the, the uh, be all and end all, but, uh, but it, it is quite uh, restricting when you want to analyze what was happening. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, uh, take you through one of these units a little bit more closely so you can um, start having a little bit of understanding of the, what they were about. And then I'm going to link it briefly to um, policy and what's happening in terms of psychiatry uh, and bro more broadly what became mental health care. Um, and then 
I'm going to try and draw it to conclusion where what it's trying to, um, where I'm trying to take it next. So I'm, I'm starting with just evidence that I've been collating. As I said, it's been quite painful. I've been going to numerous archives. I've scrutinized the um, Historic England archives because they did a survey of hospitals in the 1990s. They were not interested in the post-war at all. That was their cutoff date. But of course, when they were recording photographs and stuff, these things comes up. So I could trace a few of these. So this is the, um, the first one. It's very interesting for a number of reasons. Historically, it's very early. It's also by very famous architects, Powell and Moya. Um, they are one of the most important post-war uh, architectural practices, very, very critical festival of Britain, a lot of housing, um, uh, big post-war housing projects, colleges, uh, hospitals. So they're really, really important. Um, and it's been published quite widely. So you see it's a, it's a small cruciform building. Um, this uh, unit, this, this volume here is this unit here, this space. So what we have is four wings. Two wings are the main wards and they're female, male, which is all very important for psychiatry, how you distinguish between the genders when you start bringing them together. This is, again, critical. This is a treatment wing. So, um, and this was for electroconvulsive uh, therapy, insulin uh, care, and for outpatients as well. Uh, and this was the common room. And that's again critical. This is the room where, as you'd see this photograph, which is probably staged, uh, but you have men and women together. Again, part of how treatment is developing. That's, these are not all clearly uh, specifically post-war, but they are part of the gradual evolution and they're definitely part of, of uh, the post-war period as well. Um, so the whole building is, is, is quite interesting for a number of reasons. Um, we do have this, a mixed uh, atmosphere where you have this illusion of a domestic environment or some sort of shared accommodation. It could be um, a hotel foyer or something like that. And then you have the very, very clinical, as I said, we're talking about electro therapy. This is, uh, this is serious stuff. And you have the wards with, uh, which is quite important, uh, hospital bed, the meta hospital bed. So it's a it's a hybrid atmosphere. Again, not not completely novel. That has been um, uh, happening in previous decades as well. Uh, but it's definitely very clear here. There is this attempt to have a very small scale, which has to do with this uh, breaking down this institutional thing. Um, if I go to the next slide, um, the siding of this unit is very very important. So the main the main Asylum Mental Hospital is this building. Um, this follows very much what we used to have 19th century, early 20th century, very large, large grounds, whole communities, a lot of activities taking place. But these admission units are always sited separately. There's a particular effort here. There's outside effectively the boundaries of the main site. There's a road going in between. Um, the, there's a, a slope and the, the building is facing the other side from, from the hospital. There are trees screening it. So there's a lot of effort to make these new units uh, separate from the main hospital. The, 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 the effort is that you keep people away from the main, main mental hospital as much as possible. Some of them will never even go to the mental hospital. They'll just stay for a few weeks in the admission. They'll get well and they'll be um, uh, discharged. And here's the same thing. It's just it's at a different angle, but you can see the separation and this this effort to keep it separate. Um, this is a map. Um, as I say, uh, I started with just finding two units, and then when I carried on through a number of different depositories and archives and libraries, this is what I managed to find. I have put an end to the search because. Uh, you know, at some point I need to get on with, with analysis, but it's already to me, it's becoming clear that um, this was a widespread practice. Um, not widespread in terms of time, I'll, I'll explain more in terms of the timings, but this, this was a key thing. And, and that, you know, encourages me to, to dig deeper and understand why these were happening then. Um, so if we go back to policy, the things that I have found are the most critical in terms of these uh, units. Definitely NHS, um, we have this major reorganization of hospital, um, hospital oh, of health service, but 
the focus is on hospitals, both administrative units and buildings. Uh, great need to build new buildings, both bed, bed shortages, but also the state of the, the condition of the buildings was not up to what was needed. Um, gradually, in, in terms of, of mental hospitals as well, there was a, a, longer, a long debate before the Act passed. Will we include them? Will we not? In the end, they were included, but they were slightly separate. They still had the legislation behind them were still separate. They were still different than the physical health hospitals. So they had um, they would be under the same regional uh, hospital board, but they would have separate hospital management committees. Um, the critical thing, of course, is cost. <laughs> hospitals were a priority, but they came uh, below housing and education. Uh, a lot of budget issues. We're talking about post-war. We're talking about other sort of critical things like Korean War, a number of things that influence how you could uh, budget things. Um, so when we have in 1956 um, inquiry into the cost of the NHS, uh, mental hospitals are being dropped effectively because the realization is that the cost would be immense. Uh, and that's where we start looking at different models. That's how gradually we're moving. Uh, when we have, I'll, I'll come back to the Mental Health Act, but when we have the hospital plan, there's a completely change of approach. That's when it's decided gradually the institutionalization, rehabilitation, which was there anyway, but it became intensified community care and where we do need um, hospital care for mental illness. We're talking about wings within district general hospitals. Uh, the Mental Health Act is critical as well. That's where all the barriers between physical health and mental health are dropped. That's where there's full uh, assimilation between the role of the same. Again, a very long debate for several decades, uh, but that's where all the barriers are being removed. And that's why, of course, the proposition in 1962 that you're going to have psychiatric wings becomes feasible because there's not this separation between the two. Did I go back? Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is a different slide. So now I'm going to show a few slides quickly where with all the different units I've um, found so far, there are specific traits that start seeming, revealing similarities between them. Um, so the, the siting, which I mentioned, that there's always some kind of separation from the main hospital. These are uh, the one example we've already seen, and then another one, uh, which is the second example I had uh, identified. Uh, you can see again how it's in a separate site uh, on the edge of the main hospital. Similar thing in terms of, um, sorry, I'm just double checking. I'm, I'm addressing this in the right order. Yeah, in terms of style, um, and it will become apparent why I mentioned that, <laughs> uh, you can see they're all modern buildings. Um, so this becomes a, a quite significant thing. Britain was late to adopt modern architecture. It was, it was a slower and it was the post-war period that made the, the, the main um, shift. And it's very evident here as well that it becomes a, a critical symbolic thing that you know, it signifies changes in healthcare as well that, you know, we're, we're moving ahead. There's change, a change of approach um, in, in the public mind as well. There's an un different understanding about mental illness. So uh, all the buildings I found for the post-war period are modern buildings. Um, they're mostly uh, single story, but there are quite a few examples where a second story does exist. And that's again, a, a big debate for, for, um, for the field. Uh, and external spaces remain very important uh, and, and in very, very close relationship to the main living spaces for, for um, patients. Uh, in terms of typology, the cruciform plan became quite interesting. Um, two of the very early examples, which are here, top and bottom left, they were clearly very strongly uh, cruciform, which was very interesting. The rest vary a little bit, but there is a similar approach. It, it's quite evident that they have very um, uh, limited depth wings, so you have a lot of ventilation, a lot of light. Uh, and we'll see some big key difference when I move to the interwar period. I'm going reverse. I'm going, I'm starting from the post war and I'm going backwards the way I, I progress with the research. 
Um, this one, um, just to mention, this one is a, an example in Scotland. It's not, I'm not actually covering Scotland, but I found this, this example is quite interesting. So I do keep it on, on the side. It reminds me of you know, variation. Uh, what I was mentioning about how treatment is, is critical, uh, and it's being very evident in the environment. Uh, so you can see the world being clearly, you know, hospital wards, they're not just accommodation for people that you have locked up, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Uh, and of course, areas that um, the, the clinical spaces and actually technology is becoming a, a key thing. Um, the other side, which um, is going to come up later in the discussion, which comes part of the treatment, but it's not so closely related to um, biological approach. Uh, the, the common areas, sort of the social spaces, uh, I consider them to be, and I think that's how they were viewed at the time as well, um, they are part of the treatment offered, closer to rehabilitation, but a lot to do with um, occupational therapy. For example, the one in Fairmile, um, they were, this was definitely a common room for social um, socialization, but there were specifically uh, occupational therapy uh, activities housed in that space as well. Um, other key things that we start seeing, receptions, they become really like lobbies in any sort of like a hotel or any other space. We start having open door policy gradually. Um, you don't see a receptionist off the uh, desk with glass. And again, all these are significant things in terms of evolution of, of practices. Um, and then I'll go now uh, backwards to, because it, it became gradually clear that, uh, because I started finding early <laughs> missing units. Um, and of course, people who know more about mental health, they knew that. <laughs> thing I, I, I approached it you know, in, in my own way. So a lot of interwar um, exams were coming up uh, and some early 1940s. And this is what I found for this earlier period. So again, very, very prominent. So it becomes very clear in both periods, um, this, was a, this had become a key approach. Uh, and clearly a lot of the post-war period were because they were, the, the system was interrupted because of the war. Um, the, the red one here is the earliest I found so far. I found an acute hospital, which is it's not exactly the same, but it's quite uh, linked. Um, and then the blue ones are the early 40s, uh, and then the, the green ones are um, the interwar period, sort of more broadly. Um, the key policy now for that period uh, is what leads up to the Mental Treatment Act, 1930. So until then, what we had was the Lunacy Act, 1890, this was, um, it was a 1959 act that completely superseded the 1890, but already in 1930, what we have, first of all, even the word treatment there, that's a major shift. Uh, we're not talking about simply managing populations, we're talking about offering treatment. Uh, and the, the key things that they introduced was uh, this emphasis on treatment, how early treatment was important, and voluntary admissions, that was critical. Um, so for the first time, people can go like in any other hospital, in any other illness and say, I need treatment, I want to come to a, a, a mental hospital. And what leads up to that, already in the 20s, we have a lot of development. Um, we have, I'm still covering that material, but I already have found that in the late 1880s, 1889, I think, the very early uh, attempt to introduce acute hospitals in mental in mental hospitals like very similar to, to what developed in this admission unit we had admission wards separate from the other wards but uh, se separate buildings we had that attempt in 1889 uh, but it didn't go ahead that was with the london uh, uh, county council and then we had the Maudsley hospital in london that was very leading the way in terms of early treatment how it was important and it was, should be introduced so in the 1920s, a lot of activity. We have commissions um, vouching for the significance of bring mental and, and physical health on the same level. And then with the Mental Treatment Act, that's being uh, enforced with, with legislation as well, uh, that we need this special uh, approach where we offer uh, both voluntary and non-voluntary treat treatment early on, and that's always significant. 
and the admission units become a priority there. So now going through examples again, similar findings like the siting is, is critical. So again, away from the main mental hospital. So there is this attempt to keep people away from the main mental hospital as much as we can in case they don't need to get to that point where they, they are admitted for uh, long term. And um, this is just an example that um, is complex uh, asylum we've seen before. This is the same for the plan, the, the site plan above is the same. And we, we see here as well uh, an admission unit introduced in the 1920s. Um, also, the, the area they cover is not, um, if you compare them, the, the admission units is not negligible. They vary a lot, but they're not always smaller <laughs> than the main asylum. So here, they, they, they look, at least in terms of their footprint, they look um, you know, uh, of similar size. Um, in terms of um, their type, that's a, a very important uh, observation. We're not having cruciform plan. We don't have, there is a, a, a key emphasis on a symmetrical plan. We still have the male, female wards. We have clinical and admin staff at the back, uh, uh, spaces at the back. And my interpretation so far, because I've found a lot of verandas, solaria, um, it's a big influence with tuberculosis. Um, so that was an impact in all the built environment. We had houses, we had schools. It, it was a, a big influence that we had to offer spaces where people can be exposed to fresh space, uh, fresh air, um, sunshine. So even though these are not sanatoria, you see the adaptation, the adoption of this. Um, approach that you, you are putting the main uh, spaces for patients facing south and giving them access to outdoor spaces. So that, that, that's incredibly strong. Um, and and they're very, there is a typology developing. It's like they look a little bit like echelon plan, but simplified, like a, a fraction of an echelon plan. Um, but we do have variations. For example, I found this example where um, we have two parallel wings uh, and they're connected with uh, small links and some solaria here on the edge. And here you can spot a sick hospital. Um, and that's a different typology that I've, I've, I've identified as, elsewhere as well, more with isolation hospitals. But it, it's quite interesting, there is variation. There's not like a top-down approach that this is the way you should be doing things. But of course, you know, practice affects, you know, other people. Um, again, most of the buildings are quite modest in terms of their architecture approach. Uh, most of them that I've identified are uh, first floor, uh, one story or two story. Quite often the two story starts, uh, I've, I've seen starting, um, it starts minimizing and it could be just for staff accommodation. Uh, but quite a few of them are still two story. Uh, but as I said, really modest buildings, not particularly um, architecturally uh, extravagant, but there are uh, a few exceptions, not in terms of extravagance, but a little bit more stylish buildings and published in the architectural press. So there is, for example, this one on the left, the Fair, which was at the Fairfield Hospital, um, and then this one, uh, Kingsway Hospital, uh, and you see a little bit more elaboration with this um, circular wing at the end. Uh, again, here you, you can see the veranda, for example, the solarium, um, and uh, um, I have more drawings for the left one. Um, so this, this again shows more clearly what I was talking about, the typology. And you, you see here how they are all facing south, that they're sort of these wings uh, either side of, of a central entrance or something. Um, this one, you see here that it looks like a sick hospital we saw, but this is an admission. Hospital. Uh, this is the one we, we just saw in the previous slide, the Fairfield and the Fairfield Hospital, and you see how um, um, it's again the same approach uh, with those curved things that become both associated with solarium, but also a little bit of a more modern approach. Um, and these are uh, the variations, even more variations. The two I mentioned before with these two parallel wings, uh, but also here's another one. I haven't found anything similar to that. This is much more closely to the standard pavilion hospital, and they have these big uh, verandas up here. 
uh, which are quite enclosed, but they are open spaces. So that's the only one I found that follows this this um, example. And this is not following the pattern of the two wings are facing south, but only um, the end of the walls facing south and having this big open. Uh, so yeah, this is this is the same example. You can see here more clearly the verandas. You can see uh, walls that are opening up out. Uh, and this is the Fairfield, the Kingsway, and the Fairfield above uh, with the, the curved solari. Um, interiors again, uh, we have um, this uh, adoption of the, the hospital bed already, which uh, has, for me, it has to do with this very clear uh, shift to uh, a medical clinic, which has been covered in existing cost, um, scholarship about. Um, the, the evolution of psychiatry and, and mental health in the 20th century, that there is this major shift in the 1920s and a little bit earlier, that we're talking about not asylums, we're talking about hospitals, we're talking about nurses, we're talking about patients. Um, the operating theatre, I'll confess, um, I'm not 100% clear what the purpose was, because, for example, psychosurgery, I know in the UK, in England, came later. So my thinking is that this is probably uh, a general operating theater because they used to have hospitals for physical illnesses where there were such huge communities that they had clinical spaces for you know physical illness as well but i don't know it for a fact to be honest i have i haven't said but this is what we start having uh, incorporated into this kind of units and this is a combined map i put together which is all of them 1915 the early one in the war early 1940s and the post-war and um, what the purple thing is, um, it's sites where I've identified both in the war and post-war. Am I almost? Still five, five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the purple ones are um, the ones that um, we have in both periods uh, post-war. For example, this one um, is in Cambridge, the Fergum Hospital. And this was what well, this one was the interwar admission unit. And then they built another one next to it in the post-war period. Um, ironically, <laughs> the, the Indian War still survives. It's in different years, but it still survives. The post-war has been demolished. I, I'm not sure why it's been demolished. It could be that they were selling uh, some of the of the um, site. I, I don't know the, the reasons behind it. So now I'm going to jump to a few interpretations. As I said, I don't have full conclusions, but that's where I'm heading. So I come from an architectural background, so that's what I'm interested in. I wanted to understand how do architectural practitioners engage with the field? Where do they get information to make decisions for such a specialist area? So this is a, par this is a paragraph that was published in the architectural press uh, when the admission unit at um, Fairmile uh, was completed because it was published very widely. The fact that the architects were famous definitely played a, a role. They also collaborated, it will come up with, um, uh, they had consultants, uh, two people involved very strongly in guidance for hospitals at the time, which is really very, very influential. So what's interesting in this paragraph is this thing that uh, there is this confidence from the architectural side um, that they really convey what the direction that mental health care is taking. So they're talking about the atmosphere being reassuring, optimistic, uh, and they're matching the modern conception of mental illness as curable. So they've beaten the institutional atmosphere, uh, and, so, and now um, they do realize that there hasn't been done enough from an architectural side, but they're confident that that's what they, they are conveying. Less, a little bit less confidence uh, for the second unit um, uh, I've mentioned, uh, Sir John's. Uh, the, the less confidence is, is not in contradiction with the previous one, it is again that that hasn't been done enough, and there is this uh, requirement that we develop research teams. Um, where they're talking here about specialist teams for mental health, or they simply know, they say, this is what we've done in education, we should be doing this for this sector. It, it, it's open, I don't have more information on that. And then with the, the last one, we saw the, the Cambridge example, the, the Fairbourne um, uh, Hospital. Um, I, that's interesting because there's an emphasis on the social side of treatment, uh, where there's, there's this confidence on that side that we the building does offer 
um, essential interaction, realistic activities and close links with the outside community. So within this context, I was like, okay, I want to find out more what, where were these people getting information from? So this is a really quick um, publication, 1955, uh, by the Nuffield Provision Hospital Trust. They had an architectural unit. And the two people leading that, uh, Llewellyn Davies and uh, Wicks, John Wicks, um, they were the consultants for many hospitals, for four hospitals, including the admission units. Uh, and I do feel that where we see the cruciform plan being introduced, I think these may be examples where they were the consultants. At least two examples that, that are cruciform, they were the consultants, although they are by different architects. So there may be some connection there. But the interesting thing with this one, it specifically excluded mental hospitals. It was a general hospital specifically excluding mental hospitals. And yet the influence is critical. Here, the architects are saying, this is led by architects, but they are saying we're opening up other disciplines, we're doing in interdisciplinary research, but the key word here is functions and design. So I will need to look at my notes because I always forget that. So when they say they're opening to other uh, disciplines, the people they brought, from outside uh, architecture where, um, I'll start talking because that's the ones I remember, a statistician, a historian, a doctor, a nurse, and I can remember the, the last person. So um, nothing to do, and an accountant. <laughs> so, so you see here, the two key words are functions and design. So from a specialist point of view, as I said, this is general hospitals, the closer to the actual field were the nurse and the doctor. And the main thing they did about uh, functions was um, they were, you can see here, they were mapping uh, nurse duties. What path do they follow to a, a, a fleet nurse? So that they, uh, the, the program and the planning of, of a floral plan uh, was more efficient. We're talking about efficiency, effectively. And then the design is coming even closer there is a, a question about a patient uh, comfort, but it has to do with acoustics. It has to do with lighting. Um, and, and some other approaches will come up uh, later on. So um, the, the six bed wings that we see in some of the post-war admission units and four bed wings, they, they very much come uh, uh, four bed awards. They very much come from this publication, knowing that they're consultants. I'm pretty certain that's where it comes from. Although I said, as I said, this had nothing to do with mental hospitals. And these were designed on the basis of efficiency and, for example, lighting, having efficient daylight for all patients, but not flare. Um, these are studies that have to do with the windows uh, and measurement. So a lot to do with building science, nothing to do necessarily with how this affects uh, healthcare and treatment and all kind of things. Um, we do have other approaches that are even more distant from actual healthcare, and they are more to do with efficiency again. So this is the time we have pre-publication standardization. One could say that um, there is a link to treatment in the sense that there's full awareness that treatment changes quickly, and that was uh, explicit with the, the one in Felburn. Uh, we have a, a main engineering engineer involved here, um, and it's um, designed in a way that that can, it can take alterations if, if it's necessary in the future. Um, but I'll, I'll finish with this one mentioned because it, it's critical how it brings a different perspective. So um, this now is a publication by the World Health Organization, 1959. Uh, the main work started in 1957. Very interestingly, Dwelling Tate is the architect involved, coordinating. He's not the only one, of course, but he's the one named of the report. The other two are psychiatrists, and a British psychiatrist, and Paul Sibadon, very famous French psychiatrist. Um, it, it approaches different kinds of, of buildings. Um, there, is an, there are examples of full psychiatric hospitals, like the ones shown here, uh, but there are also smaller units that could be added. Uh, the closer I found to admissions units is uh, the early treatment, and I can't remember exactly how they called it, early treatment and rehabilitation, I think, something like that. That's the closest in terms of use um, to the admissions unit, very strongly against admission units, <laughs> explicitly stated in you should avoid them and the patient should go directly to where he's going to be looked after. 
And then there are interesting similarities, but when you look beyond the surface, the, the differences also come up. So six bad words introduced as well, and the interpretation completely different. Nothing to do with lighting, nothing to do with how you frame the windows, and more to do, uh, that's the critical thing, with social skill, um, with social dynamics. So very explicit statements within the document about how um, it's introduced initially in terms of um, the medical groups, uh, the therapeutic groups, as they call it, so doctors, social aides, nurses, how they would work better if their groupings are on the basis of theories that come from completely outside architecture and mental health. Uh, and then it's introduced in the design of spaces as well. So six bed walls on the basis of social dynamics. You can, um, you have, you offer people the, Essence, the opportunity to create sort of support groups, but also they're not too large and they don't get lost in the big words. Uh, and I will close with this final slide, which is from the introduction to the document, which is, as I said, this is, this is where I want to take it further, but I haven't yet. Uh, but it's very interesting because that document um, brings forward, it says the importance of environment uh, for mental health effectively, uh, and architecture is part of the of the of man's environment. Uh, it's important because that's what we create ourselves. It's important because it um, it not only provides solutions for needs, but it reflects culture, aspiration. It, buildings may pass from one generation to the next. Uh, and and this very interesting spelling out here about social factors. So beyond the biological, med so we're talking still about treatment, but. Uh, it's not just a biological model with physical treatments, with drugs, as we had gradually, but the more social psychiatry side of, of, of things were very explicitly, um, as I said, stated in the World Health Organization guidance that, um, you know, uh, we have social factors on psych psychiatric patients and among social factors, architecture must be included. Um, so that's where I am. <laughs> I haven't pushed that further, uh, but this for me is one of the most promising and good. There are, of course, things I, I omitted. We, we're talking about this period, 60 critical things happening, anti-psychiatry, major challenges for institutions in general, a lot of other things that are huge. But I think this is a promising line where comparing that extreme approach where you need to bring everything down with this one, which recognizes all of these limitations, but finds a different way. Uh, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that there is a, a, an interest there for me to, to compare the two. And that's where. Thank you very much.